Well, thank you so much, everyone, for joining us this afternoon. I'm Joyce Chang, and I'm the former editor-in-chief of Self Magazine and currently the founder of a new consultancy called From the Get-Go. Um, I'm launching a personal wellness platform um, in early 2018, so it's very exciting. And I've been lucky enough to be in the women's media business and in the wellness business for my entire career, and I've had the pleasure of actually working with every single one of these women in some capacity um, with their organization, whether on a panel, Donna and I were just reminiscing, um, partnerships, programs, um, fundraising efforts. And I think that actually is sort of the embodiment of what this panel is actually about. Um, and it's a driving force in the wellness um, movement. Um, that women understand that we are stronger and better together. And as leaders, brands, and communities, when we are good partners to each other um, and to our consumers and our constituents, we actually have so much more impact and such greater effect. Um, and I know that all of us in this room, men and women, I'm very happy to see some gentlemen in the room, um, we are all invested in good health is good business. Um, and the women on this panel truly have uh, led the way. So my distinguished panelists, um, Donna Karen, uh, founder of Donna Karen International and Urban Zen, Nancy Brinker, um, global consultant, cancer advocate, founder of Susan G. Komen, um, Alexia Brew, founder, co-founder of Well and Good, and Melanie Whalen, uh, CEO of SoulCycle. So this is a powerhouse panel. And sort of by way of introduction, um, I'm gonna let them talk a little bit about <clears throat> the revolutions and their own personal missions um, and how their organizations are working towards that sort of as an opening question. Um, you know, what I love about this panel is this breadth of experience. Um, when the Milken team asked me to moderate it, I just couldn't believe um, that we had such um, a spectrum of women um, who had come of age in this wellness movement at different times, and so their perspective is so amazing. Um, so to kick off, if you wanna start, Melanie, um, your defining mission personally and how uh, SoulCycle uh, fits into that. So th thank you for great, this great introduction. It's such an honor to be on this panel with this group. Um, so who here in this room has heard of SoulCycle? Who's, okay. uh, who's, it's a warm opener. Um, who's of SoulCycle? Okay, so what we create at SoulCycle um, is a space for personal transformation. And I think the biggest misnomer about SoulCycle is that we're an indoor cycling company. Mm -hmm. um, I always say the bike is the vessel to create the change, and what really happens in that room is that you have 50 people moving together in candlelight to the rhythm of the music, listening to a coach tell you that you can be stronger moving up a hill or pushing through resistance, and sharing lessons with you that you can then take into your life and be stronger as a, uh, a work person, as a mother, as a partner, as a friend, and all of this starts to create change on a really micro level. Communities are born, friendships are born, uh, breakthroughs you know, happen on the bike. And so for me, you know, fitness has always been a part of my life since I was younger. I played sports and grew up on teams and I was never the best athlete, but I love being part of a community. And, and I think what happens um, for men and women is you grow up and you go to college and you start working and that whole sort of team element of athleticism goes away, right? You become very personally motivated and personally driven. And what SoulCycle was for me when I found it in 2008 on the Upper West Side of Manhattan was a space to have that team mentality again, to have that com community mentality. Um, and I think it's something that you know, when, we, uh, when I arrived at the business in 2011 and there were seven studios in New York, we thought maybe one day there could be 20 locations, maybe New York, Los Angeles, and San Francisco. And at the same time, uh, period of time in five years, we're now in 82 locations, we're in 15 markets, we're in the United States and Canada with plans to open in London next year. And I think what it really speaks to is that people are thirsting for 
personal space and they're thirsting for inspiration and they're thirsting for connection in this connected world where we're all on our devices 24 seven. It's <clears throat> 45 minutes to put your phone away and to disconnect, have fun and really break through to the challenges that you're facing or, or uh, who you want to be in your world. We really give you the space to find yourself. Um, and for me, that's an incredibly noble mission. And when things go wrong, which they do every single day, there's always a room somewhere that you can get into to work through our own challenges as, as team members. So just really, really, really excited about everything that we still have left ahead of us to do. Alexia. Um, yeah, we like to tell people how long we've been um, at it at Well and Good. We'll oftentimes say, we launched when there was just one soul cycle. And that gives people a sense of, because um, people can't imagine when it was just one soul cycle. So um, Melissa and I founded Well and Good in 2010, early 2010, when we saw so many wellness businesses really starting to percolate, like Soul Cycle, like Blueprint. And we thought this is a really serious, newsworthy, economically powerful space that was being ignored. Um, by most journalism outlets, in our opinion. So we got Well and Good NYC at the time. That was the URL. We registered a little bit like SoulCycle. We couldn't imagine that we would grow nationally, but very quickly we did. And even when we were just writing about New York City, 70% um, of our traffic was coming from outside of New York. So there was this fascination with these businesses like SoulCycle and how that was going to affect the rest of the country. And um, we felt that wellness, um, was an intimidating term. It needed to be demystified for people. Um, a lot of times people think about wellness as being this two-pronged fitness and food, and those are, those are that's wellness. Um, for us, it really touches all aspects of a person's life, from obviously the fitness and the food, but also what we put on our skin, what we're cleaning our homes with, how we're mindful parents, how we're mindful about how we manage money. And so as we've grown, we really cover all of those facets of um, what it means to lead a mindful life that's focused on wellness. Um, and so, and we've also been very much about um, spotting what's next for our readers. So we really try to, to filter out all, everything that's going on in this space, tell her who she can trust, what products um, she can try, that we've tried, all of our journalists try and vet everything before we present them to our readers. Um, and we think there's just gonna be more and more information about wellness and more need for high quality information to help guide people. Nancy. Well, uh, thank you, nice to be here today with all of you. Um, I'm Nancy Brinker and my sister was Susan Coleman and she died at the age of 36 of breast cancer, my cherished older sister, in a time when you couldn't use the word breast or cancer. <laughs> cancer was the big C, now, which meant the big C was cancer, now it's the big, now the big C is cost, but that's a different time. That tells you the progress we've made, but mm -hmm. she asked me to cure this disease and I thought it was very smart and thought it would take just a few minutes or a couple of weeks or whatever. We put a man on the moon, by day two, I realized how not smart I really was and how it was probably going to take the rest of my life. And it's been an amazing journey, and I'm thrilled for the growth of our organization and thrilled with a lot of the research we funded. Um, it's been 40 years for me doing this uh, since she was diagnosed and died and then started the organization. And I, that's probably older than the, the average age of most of you women in this audience, and I'm thrilled that's true, too, because we're here talking about a subject it has gone underfunded, underloved, and unrecognized for so long that for those of us who've been working in this field, to see the news yesterday of the 40% decline overall in, in death rates, and, and it's really due to awareness and screening, is a good story on one hand, and it's not so good on another because there's so much that needs to be done to ultimately learn how to prevent this and other chronic diseases. And I might add, for the first time in my life in many years, we were always told how long we would live. My parents lived a very long life. I've always wanted to outlive what they did, functionally and every other way. And now we're told that we may not live as long as our pair. My parents did. Um, and so we've got to ask ourselves how we can not make that happen, how we can live long, full lives and afford our lives and do them in the best way that we can. So I'm thrilled to be a part of this today and to uh, add whatever uh, humble opinion I can except to say that we're at a time now that demands our closure of all of these issues very quickly. We need to start adding closure, and as far as women and women's issues and what we need to do, uh, we need to really move and move fast and aggressively and provide the best leadership we can. 
grass best. We slow. You can tell I've been doing this a little too long. So. Hey, you did that so time. beautifully. <laughs> I don't know how I can, you know, talk after all of you, but um, I've been on this journey for many, many years. Um, as we all know, each and every one of us is going to be a patient. Each and every one of us is going to be a loved one. Uh, and how do we deal with it? And we're all going to die. <laughs> you know, it's the question of when and how. And I realized, in respect, there was so much money going into solving the disease. Who was caring for the men, women, children, nurses, doctors out there for caring for the patient? Um, unfortunately, I've had death my entire life. Uh, my boss, Ann Klein, where I first started when I was 18, uh, passed away to cancer. And as you said, in those days, it was never ever discussed you know, as you said, the C word. And I was having a baby. Uh, I was in getting a collection for the time I was a designer, uh, Frank Klein. And I was in the hospital delivering my child. And my boss was in the hospital, unfortunately dying of cancer. And I had not known that. And they said to me, uh, when are you coming back to work, Donna? I said, well, I just had a 10 pound baby girl. Thank God I was 10 <laughs> days late. <laughs> But when the baby came out, they said, well, that's nice, but we have a collection due. <laughs> I said to the doctor, when can I go back to work? And they said, uh, well, you can't. You just had a 10-pound baby girl. And I said, oh, don't worry. You know, all the stitches, they could stitch me up in the sample room. But that's not how it worked. Uh, <laughs> so he said, you have no idea how you're going to feel. And he was absolutely right. They brought the entire company to my home, which I thought, oh, my god, they're going to see my baby. And my daughter, Gabby, was born. And Rachel, obviously, is like my other daughter. And at that moment, all the clothes were coming in. Everything was coming into my home. And a call came through. My boss just died. And I had a show due the next week. So it was, I was shocked. I was absolutely shocked. There was no definition of cancer. My father died when I was uh, two years old, and I've had death, death, death all around me. And it got very, very clear when my best friends were dying, my boss was dying, my mother was dying, and I was living in a hospital, basically, as the, the other one. And most people know of me, and they said, oh, there she goes on a woo-woo trip. Uh, the reason I had a bodysuit is because I practiced yoga since I was 18 years old. So in those days, people thought, oh, there she goes, you know, meditating, yoga, but then there's the other part of me, you know? So that's why I wear a bodysuit every day of my life, by the way. <laughs> so you start with your bodysuit, put it on your leggings, then you throw all your clothes on top of it. So it's dressing and addressing the issues at hand. It's not just dressing. Um, and I realized when the AIDS epidemic broke out, nobody wanted to discuss AIDS. All my friends were dying. And I said, this is ridiculous. Absolutely ridiculous. Nobody wanted to talk about it. Oh, we can't discuss this. And so I started a thing called Seventh on Sale, which I was dressing and addressing. Because I found most of the time I was in a dressing room, and then I heard the story. You know how when we go to the hairdresser? And uh, that's when you can talk to your hairdresser. But most people were talking to me about what they were dealing with in their life. And then after that, I did um, Kids with AIDS found out all these children, women were dying of AIDS, and then afterwards I realized it's conscious consumerism, to dress and address. So it's not only what you're wearing on the outside, but we're wearing on the inside. And you could be as beautiful wearing the hottest thing in the world, but if you're not well on the inside. So putting that all together, I started Urban Zen. Past, present, and future. Past is the wisdom of our cultures. That's where the wisdom comes from. That's where our knowledge comes from. The present is health care. Where is the care in health care? The future is education. So I believe in education that we have to give the children and the teachers the uh, tools of calming down. Meditation, yoga. We can all sit here right now and feel what it's like. It takes one minute and you'll be in another space. And all we have to do is put our feet on the floor and take a breath. It's that simple. Thank you. Such noble missions. Um, and 
I can see that like people in the room have chills from these stories. Um, we, like Donna, we all have histories and experiences um, with our families, with our friends, with our mothers um, who have had various diseases. And um, Nancy, you have been a pioneer and at the forefront of women's health for so long. Um, as you said, 40 years. So much has changed and there are still things that are the, that are the same. And we'd love to hear you know, your perspective on how things have changed and what things we still really need to work on. Well, you know, things have changed. I, I, I guess I, it's, a, it's a very broad question. So yes. I'll try to answer, answer as, the, as I yeah. can. Um, I see enormous change in, in the United States, and, and I've served overseas twice and seen not so enormous change in the rest of the world. We have enormous disparities in the world where there is no care, and as you say, Donna, where's the care in health care? Uh, where is there any care? And then, <clears throat> but in the going back to the United States, let's say, there's been, a, there's been a, an awakening, a really wonderful awakening in most parts of our society, except in the underbelly. The disparities are growing because our population is growing. Um, there's not enough education, there's not enough access to care, and there's not enough affordability of care anywhere. And what I see is this enormous revolution in not just prevention of disease where we need to go desperately because it's too expensive what we're doing now, treating disease. It's way too expensive. And yet we're very close to extending the lives, particularly of cancer patients, with all the new things that we've discovered and we, we don't use data fast enough. We need clean, elegant, wonderful data that almost anyone can use anywhere to help them in a navigation. But we're really going to have to focus today on community health. We're really going to have to, each of us, because a lot of the health care in this country, as we've seen and as we've grown as a country, really harkens back to, a, to cultural differences. And we have to take care of people in our communities. And oftentimes, people who are treated in their own communities do better, live better, have, a, you know, as Donna said, have a, a spirituality that can allow them to have better lives, because so many deaths, look, opioid epidemic today, what is it a result of? Hopelessness, you know, lack of future, lack of hope. And, and we can provide that in our communities. We need to do better, and we can do it. And so while I've seen this enormous revolution and enormous investment in treating disease, we really have to focus on where it begins. And not just disease, but living better, living longer, and loving and having a spiritual life. I think you touch on something that's so, um, that's so relevant right now, and that's the word community. Mm -hmm. um, I think a lot of times, historically, we've thought, it, thought of it as something small. Yeah. The idea of grassroots doesn't feel big enough in this sort of um, contemporary global world. But um, the importance of community has only become more and more apparent. And the usage of the word community has actually changed. Um, and the definition has changed. And community is now actually a strategy. And um, it's a huge part of uh, brand expansion, um, community efforts, whether they are through technology, social, in person, um, and I think what everyone on this panel has done so exceedingly well is they have galvanized a community and they have created a community. You've created a community of um, uh, philanthropy and activists and advocates. Um, you've created a community around the world. Um, there's a well and good community. There is a soul cycle community. And you know, I'd love for, I'll open it up for any of you to sort of talk about how you guys build your community and what your community means to you. Maybe, do you want to start, Donna? Yeah, sure. It, so, <coughs> oh, excuse oh, me. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't mean that at all. Um, Please forgive me. We, we have, uh, community has always been a huge part of how we have built our, our business and, and our studios. You know, when we, when we open a studio, we just simply go into the market and we open the door and we invite in the first two days anybody that wants to come in and try a class in for free because we know that there's really only one way to express what soul cycle is for people and that's through the, having them experience it themselves. And we've tried advertising and we have tried videos and, and all of it is very exciting and can certainly amplify something. 
But 80% of the people that come in the door come there because of a friend. And we really do try to recognize and celebrate that because this business is, is truly a word of mouth business. And that's the most authentic way to bring people into your community. And I, I've been so struck today listening to all of the work that is going into fundamental change in the public sector and the private sector around the opioid crisis and, and other you know, major challenges that this country is facing. And I, and I said to someone I was sitting with at lunch that there's all of this sort of macro conversation happening, but unless there is micro conversation happening at the community level so that we rise up to accept these solutions and have personal accountability around the role that we play in our health, that these guys are going to fail. And so what, what can we do at this level to sort of mobilize communities to create this change and to be open to it? And I think for us, what we have seen is what community has created is a sense of accountability and purpose. You know, you know that you're going to see someone at six o'clock in the morning. When my alarm went off at 5.15 upstairs this morning, I really didn't want to turn over and go down to meet my friend at six o'clock in our studio across the street. But I knew that she was going to be there and I'd promised her I was going to make it. So I was definitely going to make an, you know, a real purposeful um, and well-intentioned sort of direction to be there. And I think that's truly what our community has created is this sense of accountability and the sense of shared purpose that leads to so much change just beyond what's happening on the bike. We're going to do two classes together this week and we're going to cut out dairy and we're going to stop drinking on the weekends and we're going to do this. And we always say it's this and story that really creates the change and we really view ourselves as the catalyst for that change because the hardest part is just getting onto the bike. Once you're clipped in, my girlfriend that came this morning for the first time, she said, I'm so nervous in the dark when the lights went down. And I said, the hard part's done. You're here, you're clipped in. Now you just have to go on the journey with us. And when you come out the other side, what's the next commitment that you can make to yourself to keep that accountability going? So I think that the community, it has evolved even as we've talked about it. First it was just the word of mouth and now it's the, the community and, the commitment and, the accountability and. And I think that for us is really the next the next chapter. I mean, I think for you guys, your community is so based mm -hmm. on um, knowledge and mm -hmm. information and education and shared knowledge and a shared mindset. How do you use information to sort of build your community? Yeah. So. I mean, at this point, we have about 7 million people per month that interact with Well and Good in some way. Um, and, you know, we like to think, so we're doing 25 stories a day on various topics. And some people might come for the food content and they discover that they love natural beauty and they want to clean up their beauty routine. Um, so there's, it's nice to see the community build in that way. Um, and we always felt like it was very important also to have an events component to what we did. So from the month that we launched, we always had, we started events basically that first month, and we do anywhere from 30 to 50 a year, so that it's largely our communities in certain key cities, but that they get to see each other, meet each other, and then, you know, share socially in that way. Um, I think what's been really exciting to see over the last 10 years is how social um, wellness has become, and that's something that we've really championed at Well and Good. So, I mean, we've all seen the research on if you have a, um, healthy peer group, that massively increases your chance of eating better and working out more. So we're so, we're all so influenced by who we're spending time with. And um, so we really strive to create very shareable conversation. We always ask ourselves, like, is this passing the um, dinner party conversation bar? Is this something that's interesting enough that people are going to want to share at dinner? Um, and, you know, by sharing that content, the whole community um, becomes healthier. And when we look at millennials now who comprise um, about 60% of our readership, um, you know, I am so, Melissa and I are both so jealous of the way that they're growing up because when, you know, we are, we are uh, you know, came of age in the 90s and our social lives were not so healthy. And now we see the rise of what people call sweat working or, you know, there are many terms for it, but this idea that you're gonna go out for a run, um, with a friend or colleagues, you're gonna to go to an indoor cycling class or whatever it is. And that's really um, transformative, I think. And um, I think that that kind of culture around being healthy together will just continue to grow. Um, I think and it's fun, and I think that's a really key part of it, is that there was, uh, wellness used to be a little bit of a bummer. It was like about smoking cessation and like kind of, you know, things that just didn't feel exciting. And wellness should be so much fun. And to hear Indra talk this morning about, um, you know, the uh, fun for you foods, like fun for you foods should be kale chips, should be Brussels sprouts, you know, and we really try to 
say, okay, eating healthy is delicious. That is the fun for you foods. Um, so, baby I steps. I think I just, that communities are based around joy and they're also, you know, based around calm and peace and purpose. And Don, I feel like your urban zen stores create these um, city hubs of urban zen. And when you walk in, you feel the calm. But what you've also been able to do way beyond the store and the concept of urban zen is you've created a global community that you serve. You know, it's so interesting and I hear all the positive and I'd like to feel myself positive. <laughs> but I guess because I'm a designer, I expect it to change. I have to do a collection every whatever comes out, goes out, comes out, goes out. Next, 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 I'm on to the next. This is the hardest thing I have ever done in my entire <laughs> life. <laughs> Creating a community of change. Now, I was most inspired by President Clinton. And I was a major advocate from the very beginning of the Clinton Global Initiative. And it kind of blew me away. And the first thing I was in is healthcare, 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 healthcare. And then, kind of pulled me into Haiti. I said, where's Haiti? Uh, <laughs> sorry about that, I didn't really know. Of course, I, live, I have a place in Parakei, and it's only a half a mile away. Uh, sorry, a half hour away. And they said, well, you know, got to do an event for Haiti and make money. I have a studio, uh, the Urban Zen Center, where I create a community of change, healthcare, education, and culture. As you, the whole concept is bringing people together who want to create change. And I don't expect everyone here, I, wonderful that we're all here in healthcare, there are a lot of people in education, there are a lot of people here and there, and you have to find what's closest to your heart. And that's the way you make it go. So, uh, we had a 10-day seminar on healthcare. I don't think I've ever gotten over it. <laughs> I am so tired from that 10 days, and Rachel uh, <coughs> helped me assist in that. We had every doctor, um, traditional doctor, untraditional doctor, every nurse, every yoga teacher, all, all women, all getting together to deal with our health care issues that we're facing today. And out of that, um, my yoga teacher, Rodney Yi, some of you might know him and some of you may not, uh, said, well, why do we use the yoga community? And I go, oh, oh it's beyond yoga. <laughs> I said, uh, I need the oils, essential oils. I need the meditation. I need Reiki. Well, I didn't realize the Reiki until I realized that they can't touch the patient when they're in the hospital because they're not licensed to. So, and the end-of-life care. So where is that one person? I believe it's two. I don't believe it's one the one person to care for the patient, the loved one, inside and outside of the hospital. Then you need a patient advocate, navigator. We're going from one place to another place to another place. I am so confused right now. You know, is it my ear? Is it my eye? Is it my nose? Is it my throat? You try to keep up with this. Now, a lot of you are very young. <laughs> However, when you get to be a little bit of a certain age, and I was totally holistic, all of a sudden, the knock on the door said, I've got to go to the doctor, regular doctor, and hospitals. And I said, you got to be kidding me. I am so confused. I don't remember all these people, what they're telling me. We have to create. They talk about job creation. Too perfect job creation. Take care of a person. The more you give, the more you get. Creating a community of consciousness and change. Get in schools. There are so many schools out there that only care about um, history and biology and this and that. But who's taking care of these kids in what they're eating, how they're thinking, how they're breathing? A simple little thing. I never went to school. I found myself, I was one of those little paired people who only liked to be in the art room. So I used to sort of say I wasn't in school, but I was in the art room creating clothes. Uh, there are a lot of very autistic people. So as I started, I'm in Haiti now through President Clinton, and it was a disaster area. No question, it still is not to the extent, but I'm still in Haiti. And I realized I wanted to open my dream, and that was a village. 
a village where people come together, that it's not about me, it's about the we. And this village was going to be, because they have terrible deforestation. There's no trees. I said, bamboo, bango. Put bamboo in, you build up this community, and everything starts to happen. You live there, you have your healthcare system there, you have your education there, and then give them a fishing rod. Let them create product. The minute you create product, you get your finances coming in. So when you go to a, a country outside of you know, where we are, even in our own schools, creativity is so there, it's in their soul. Haiti, sorry, Haiti, Haiti, Haiti. You don't want to know it's from Haiti. You want to look at it because you like it. Then comes the story behind it. So there you capture the consumer. And I really believe in conscious consumerism. I really am frustrated, so I have to tell you all, that take taking the edge in healthcare, and God only knows I love Mike Milka more than anything else in the world, it's not happening fast enough. It's just not. And I think the preventative care is fantastic. Exercise, all of this, but each one of us is gonna be a patient at some point. And we've got to take care of this. And it's not either or, it's and, sorry. Um, it's and to put these aspects together. And uh, as you said, it's creating a community, communities of consciousness and change. And it, this is not about me, please, guys. It's about you. Each one of you have to create that community. You all have mothers, your fathers, friends. I'm sure we've all been accepting of this. And we have to get involved in education in helping others around the world. You know, maybe they don't have it good, but it's happening in our own country, right here in front of our eyes. So I thank you all for everything you're doing, and I just ask you to help. That's all I can possibly do. I mean, I think the ways, um, it's such, the fact that you were able to create a village and create an entire ecosystem that is a sustainable community. Um, I think we're thinking about communities in all different ways now. And um, that, as ancient as that sounds, that's actually an innovation. And I think that there is innovation and disruption are two sides of the same coin. And we're looking at so much disruption right now, but it's also creating so much innovation. And it's changing the sense of the word community and how you take care of each other. Um, and I was reading about, um, Philanthropy, uh, philanthropy and charitable giving to health charities is up, way up, 6% this year. Um, it's at $35 billion in this country, which is a huge number, but still not enough. But the ways that generations are giving is actually very different. Um, and when you look at the millennial generation and how they give, um, they, they want to give through crowdsourcing. They want to give to one person whose story they see, and they want to be able to track the progress of um, you know, how the fundraising is going for this cause. How do you see disruption and innovation happening in the philanthropy well, world for it's, you? It's very interesting you bring it up, because we've <coughs> spent a lot of time on it, because our organization's been around a long time. And so there are lessons you learn. There's nothing new. There's nothing new about this, because this is the way, if you look back over the generations, when, the, when, when President Roosevelt started basically the, po the polio movement. I mean, every disease movement has taught us things. In, in my case, when you talk about communities, it's very important to penetrate a number of communities during your lifetime. There's never one way of thinking, and there's never one way of doing something. And you have to seek to understand before you want to be understood. Stephen Covey always said, which was a great sort of philosopher, executive teacher mm. in America for a long time. And it's so true. And I think about the communities I belong to, the cancer community, the gay community. My son is gay, and I had a whole education about the community itself and how they could advocate and what they did and what their signals are and their issues are. And, uh, you know, a spiritual community, a, a sports community. I used to do horse sports now. I box. 
try something new all the time, learn something new, challenge yourself every day with never listening. You can't do this because you are so and so or because you have, you have to always challenge yourself and challenge yourself to always reach out and understand before you want to be understood. That is the key factor of life. And therefore, because our country is becoming so, with so many uh, cultures that are now becoming in a way one, there's so many cultures in our country that are beginning to, to become, you know, join, join each other, to intermarry. They have children together. They become, you know, all, it's very interesting. It's, it's a map and it's a, it, it's, it's a beautiful uh, sort of cake that's being baked under our eyes and we just can't allow politics or whatever it is. We have to act on a set of beliefs and the only way to do that is is to believe in something and to be able to move it forward and stick with it and know there's going to be great disappointment, great joy, and great turns in the road. But at the end of the day, as long as there's going to be so much high tech, there's going to be even more and more need for high touch things, always. And people are hungry for that today. That's why we're communicating in 140 characters, which at times I love it, at times I loathe it, depending on who's doing it. Mm -hmm. Point is, I'm not making a comment there, but I just I do I get some totally of these tweets understand. every day. Huh. I get tweets from people that I go, what in the, what are they talking about? You know, and, and whatever. But um, I think it's important that we you know that we continue to understand. And we we are living in the most amazing time you could ever imagine. My father used to say that he live from Orville Wright to computers, and he used to say to me, I can't imagine what your life's going to be. I couldn't either. And, and so um, I'm very optimistic, actually, because I think the millennials, as frustrating as they can be, I have an assistant now who I love, a new assistant who's, I call her a fully functioning millennial, because <laughs> she comes to work, she works really hard, she does the job till it's done, and, um, and she's terrific. Adrian, I don't know where you are, but thank you for being terrific. But anyway, um, I'm very optimistic because she's optimistic and, and you, you can learn from each other. And so I, I have a lot of hope and I think, you know, I still think America is the greatest country in the world. I think we're the most generous people in the world. I don't think we should ever stop being generous. And I'm, the only thing that I don't like is when people who are as successful as like Don, I were sort of in the same, well, I think I'm older probably than you are, but Probably not. Aren't generous. <laughs> Aren't generous. There, there, you know, every single person in this room, and I know there are a lot of wonderful men here too. I'm not, but I, you know, if you're a woman and you're fortunate enough to be successful in your life, learn very early to give back. And it doesn't matter whether it's five dollars or five hundred million dollars. Give back. You owe it because too much, too much is given, much is expected. So thank you. <laughs> That's all I have to say. <laughs> I, I just. Uh, Admire all of you so much, and thank you for having me. And I'm, any questions? I'll do what I can. We're still asking. <laughs> We're still asking. I mean, the volume of change and innovation, um, the volume of trends. Um, how do you, at Well and Good, um, how do you keep up with the volume? I mean, how do you keep up with this? And not only with such an onslaught of new, new, new. Mm -hmm. How do you educate? your reader to balance um, openness with skepticism and sort of an, an educated approach? Yeah. Um, so I think when we, when, we, when we started at this in 2010, I don't want to say that there wasn't a lot to cover, but we, we felt like we were covering the wellness space fairly successfully. And now we have a much bigger team. We have 50 people on the team at this point. 20 of whom are, are editors are on the editorial side and we have a really hard time keeping up with everything there's just so much more going on in terms of books written products launching if anyone's ever been to expo west there are 5,000 food brands that are out there in the healthy space it's amazing um so there's and you just guys do an amazing job i would say that you're the go-to trend spotter in the space you're there first really seriously yeah um and we hire um you know journalists who have either been to journalism school uh, or have done you know very serious writing program and we really hold them to print standards or as close to that as we can get for the fast-paced um, digital um, what you know what's required digitally um, but we have you know really rigorous fact checking they all have to have so multiple sources in their articles you know we really vet things 
Um, and then there's a lot of stuff. You know, early on we used to write stories about, hey, this isn't worth your time and money. Because it's also like people are spending a lot of time and money um, you know, in the wellness space. And we got very immediate feedback that no one wanted to be told um, that that was a downer, that that was, you know, that was negative. No one wanted anything negative. And we're like, hey, we're just trying to save you money. Um, but now we just, we just report on what we think is excellent. Um, and so if you don't see it in Well and Good, it's not because we don't know about it. It's because we don't think that, um, you know, it's worth sharing. Um, and then there's some things that we just cover because it's really culturally interesting. It's not necessarily that we're endorsing it or think that people should go out and try it, but we think it, it's that passes that dinner party worthy bar and that, you know, people should know about it. Um, yeah. Can I ask you a question? Uh, during your, you know, communication, do you have time to say, okay, what are you committing to? So it's not only communication, but commitment. So the energy that you know, we speak about, you get commitment. And I, I think when we have these conversations and uh, inspire people, mm -hmm. you know, and you get it at that moment, you know, what are you committing to? What are the commitments that you're looking yeah. for for the community mm -hmm. to commit to? Um, because you know, as I say, when we do our seminars, um, which I, again, I learned from President Clinton, you could not walk out of that place until you committed. <laughs> you were committed. <laughs> you know, I think there's a word about that. And when people commit, they commit from their heart and soul. You know, it's something that they want to accomplish to create that community that they're frustrated with. And I don't know where all your frustrations are because God only knows we all have them. Uh, could be a weight, could be this, could be that. And how do we help and put that desire into action? I think the wellness community is a great community that likes to commit. I mean, I think overall, whether you're committing to an eating program, a workout program, commitment is sort of in, in our blood. Um, and at South, we used to do these programs um, that are, that are um, programs that you would commit to, like at the beginning of the year or periodically, and it was a challenge. And you would sign up and you would commit and you would commit over the course of 30 days. But the way that the commitment locked um, was that there was constant communication. And through the tool of social media, the community was able to come alive and keep each other accountable because you'd see a post, and I'm sure you guys do the same, do something similar, and, and SoulCycle has that sort of real-time check-in where you're in constant communication. You see the 300 people who did that workout and how it made them feel, and it is sort of the one-two punch of, I get your commitment, and I'm gonna keep communicating with you so that you know, we know, we're all in it together. And I think that's one of the great uh, powers that technology has sort of given us to stay in communication, to check in on your commitment. Because when you waver and you see someone else who, you know, logged in the time, it's motivating to you to renew your commitment each time you kind of re revisit it. But the beautiful thing of, of teaching children Mm -hmm. You know, and a lot of us, you know, have, I don't want to say spoiled our kids, and some of the kids are really, sp some spoiled, that uh, if the schools have them go out there and make something, create, you know, when I was exposed to things that were shocking, mm -hmm. it blew my mind. I mean, when I went, I teach at Parsons School of Design, and I started a graduate program there, and I said, you know, guys, don't go to work. Just forget it. I don't want you to go to work. And, and I sit on the board of directors. It's kind of weird, right? And I said, I want you to go out into the world mm. and help those not as fortunate. Now, it could be in our country. It could be in another country. Um, it's sort of like in Israel when you have to serve the country and going into the army before you go into your thing. And I think a lot of us, after high school, you know, particularly run off to college, have some fun, or unless you really know, I must be a doctor, you know, but maybe that doctor is helping another country or helping another city that doesn't have that. Um, and I, I keep,
feeling that we've got to ingrade that into ourselves, into our schools, into our communities of being of help. And I think having these kids go out to, particularly designers, uh, and not particularly, I mean, whatever you're good at, you know, speech, communication, anything, and getting these developing countries that don't have the money and need that help and support. It is the most gratifying thing. Uh, when I go into a hospital in Haiti, I am blown away. Now, we don't speak the same language, and it's amazing all over the world. Breath is breath. Calming is calming. Taking these nurses, and mostly nurses, as we all know, are being beaten all over the world. How do we take care of these wonderful people who 24-7 are taking care of patients? You know, and this is in every place. And then the people who aren't being taken care of, they need help. When disasters roll out, you know, who's out there? Yeah, the nurses and doctors are running and running, but you could be of assistance. And how do you help these people? And, and you're so right, because some of the barriers to care, aside from the very important subjects you've talked about that are extremely important, are actually very simple. So we know so much about cancer today. We know some, we have a hundred and, 20 affiliates throughout the world, millions of people working on this cause over the years, and yet the two biggest barriers to bring them into any kind of education or awareness or treatment, uh, transportation mm. and navigation. Mm. Those two things, not that hard to figure out, and yet we have all this complex billions of dollars every year invested, and these are simple, simple things. This is where, this is where it comes in the community. This is where it comes to. And I think you're so right to focus on what's next is transportation and having access, really concrete things. Um, and for you, um, ingraining it into your daily culture of your community, of your of your office, of your of your life, that there is something that you have to give back and to be creative in how you you add. What do you guys think is, is next? What do you think is the next piece of your revolution? What do you want to see happen? If we're leading rev the revolution here, what do you want to see happen next? What's mm -hmm. the future hold? Well, I mean, we look at, if you look at 75% of our healthcare costs in this country are from completely preventable things, we see the content that we're putting out as like chipping away at that, you know, mm -hmm. so that there isn't the need for all of this um, sick care. I mean, I think, um, I think that's just access, making healthy choices really easy. I mean, we all know when we're, when we're traveling and we have to run into a gas station, there are no healthy food options, right? And so mm -hmm. there are just times when like, we might just want some almonds and, and whatever, and it's just not there. And I think, um, you know, as we solve the problem of these food deserts and Amazon makes that, um, and, and other companies, although Amazon seems to run the world, but you know, solving issues of accessibility like that, will be huge, but I think, you know, and it's so heartening to see the way companies like PepsiCo are remaking their portfolio, and I can't even think of a CPG company that isn't hyper-focused on making healthier products. I mean, they all see the future. So, you know, as soon as the fun products become what's healthy, I think that's what's gonna get really exciting and what will really, really chip away at that 75% of unnecessary healthcare costs. Um, and so we just wanna continue to celebrate the fun in this lifestyle and that when you, commit to wellness, there's no deprivation involved, and I think that that's culturally a shift that needs to happen, that, you know, it's amazing to wake up at 5.30 and go to SoulCycle, and then you have an amazing day afterwards, and there's also so much that's free online. You know, mm -hmm. people cannot all afford classes that are that expensive, but if you go online and Google, you know, free online fitness class, there are thousands and thousands of high quality search results that come up. So it's not a lifestyle that people need to spend money on. Um, and I think we really want to champion wellness for everyday people. I think it does sometimes get a little bit of a, a bad rap in the PR world that it's, it's an elitist pursuit or that it's an expensive pursuit, but um, nothing could be further from the truth and we try to show that every day on Well and Good. Yeah, I think it's, it's an interesting segue because one of the things that I'm most proud of that we've accomplished in the last couple of years is we realized pretty quickly that we run classes from 6 to 10 and then in the evening and we have this studio sitting empty during the course of the day 
and we sit very close to many underserved communities where there are children that don't have access to even PE in their schools. And so we created a program called Soul Scholarships where we bus children from underserved communities into our studios and off peak times and we give them access to Soul Cycle classes, but then even more importantly, mentorship, nutritional counseling, job readiness preparedness. Wait, wait. It's very kind to clap. I was actually speaking this morning to someone at my table saying, I'm so frustrated because the impact isn't big enough yet and how we can create scale behind programs like this because I can see that the fitness is fun and it creates this wonderful flywheel effect of the other changes that the children are making in their lives. But when we interview them after the eight weeks, the number one thing that they say to us are the healthy choices that they're making in the grocery store with their parents is the number one thing that they're taking away from us. That is super tangential to our mission and our business and what we create, but if that's the impact that we can have, and the Surgeon General said that this morning, that the impact of one role model in a child's life in terms of informing resilience in their own life is so great. If we can create that kind of program at scale, and I agree with Alexia, there is so much of this information out there that's free, but we have to package it in a way that's going to have impact for these children. Because I also agree with Don, I think it's around the, the education and the integration in this next generation and making sure that they've got access to the information, it's packaged in a way that they can digest. And then they've got community connection to enforce that accountability. And if we're able to do that on our platform or on any of our platforms, I think we can create the change that we need to see. Um, what a panel. So much to think about. Um, I want to turn it over to you guys if you have some questions. I'm sure um, we'd love to answer them. Anyone? Yeah. yeah. Um, and maybe, maybe to Nancy, but uh, one of the, the places that we're going in general with health, um, I'm the dean of the School of Public Health here in, at uh, just a few blocks away, George Washington University is trying to move in the direction of more personalized approaches, uh, both to prevention and to treatment. And I'm just wondering uh, how, how you, you know, absorb that into the work that you do. And, um, well, it, it's a very good question because if we don't start utilizing personal, sort of personal evaluation of people all the way from their genetics to their habits, and, and again, it goes back to data. It goes to heck to really having good data that we can share. We're getting to a place where now the doctor's office is coming home. It's on your, your screen. You can measure biometrics in places. Everybody should go to the doctor prepared or a physician if they need to see them, almost like a guide so that you can walk in and say, here are my blood levels. Here's this going on if you're a patient. This is what I, what I'm, this is my deficit. And, and to know that ahead of time and to have a control of that. Part of what happens with a cancer patient uh, is the lack of control, lack of control and hopelessness and helplessness. And we have to speed this up. We are capable of sharing data in this country. It's our data. We own it. And we need to stop you know, the, the use and practice of bad data or not knowing where it really came from or what it really represents. And it's certainly not going to be a cure for these diseases, but it's going to speed along our understanding of human progress, of our basic biology, our gene pool, and what we need to do to treat disease early, very early disease, and not just with medication and treatment, but with all the strategies so many of us have been wondering about for so many years, what we are eating, what we are breathing, how much activity do we need? And you know what, another thing we don't talk enough about yet is sleep. How much rest are we getting? Your body can't recover and act properly if you don't sleep well, and very few of us, I would guess, in this room are getting our eight hours. I read this article that it was horrifying. It said, you know, unless you do, your brain can't function. But part of what they say is wrong with people with Alzheimer's is they've had a life of stress, no sleep, no rest, no calm, no peace, no meditation. And, you know, seriously, so there, there's, there's a holistic approach to all this that will develop over time, and it just needs to happen sooner than later. Mm. But don't you feel if you, if you train your children, <laughs> you train them at a young yes. age, yes. even if you're sitting around a dinner table, and before they start the dinner, it's like taking a prayer. Right. You know, when we used to pray, and we used to have a prayer. You know, we sit around the dinner, dinner table. To me, it's community. It is. You know, putting, connecting the dots between our community and everything that we're all in. I have one dream in, the, in, my, in my life. If I can accomplish this, I promise I'll get off the stage. I won't, I'll stop talking, and that's it. Um, I was in Turkey. You know the call to prayer? Yeah. Mm -hmm. when you hear the sound. 
So I don't, where does the sun rise? I think, I keep on getting this a little bit. East. In the east, right? But is there, it's a particular country oh. or area. Anyway, the sun rises in the east. So I figured at one o'clock every single day, there would be a sound, a sound for prayer. Now, you have to stop at one o'clock for one minute. I don't care if you're on the battlefield or wherever, anyway, and connect to yourself and to another one person. Then it goes one, 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 one. The whole world is connected, <laughs> if you think about it. Now, in New York, you might hear, you know, a beeping of a horn, you know, uh, you know some sort of sound. Uh, maybe it's a splashing of a water. Something that connects you. And I learned this when I was in Turkey, and I couldn't understand why was everybody stopping? And they were praying. Mm -hmm. And I said, so if we could do this at 1 o'clock every single day, and mm -hmm. I'm having a tough time getting this done. I'll probably in my second life, or my third or fourth or fifth, <laughs> come back. But um, connecting the world, you know, and respecting each one of our own essences. And we could do it in a community. We can do it at school. We can do it at home. We could do it everywhere, you know, wherever we are, if we just stop for one moment to connect, to connect to ourselves, connect to the next person. But my dream is have the whole world connected because unless we connect and collaborate and communicate, change will not occur. Mm. Any other questions? There's mm. so many, here in the front. Do what? Build a community. That's easy. Okay. You have a friend? Yeah. Your friend has a friend? Your friend has a friend, friend, friend. You live next door to somebody. You go to school. You go to the workplace. That's a community. You, wherever you go, there is a community. Your husband, your wife, your friend, this one knows that one, that one knows this one. And I remember when seven, um, September 11th happened, right? Nobody asked who I was, what I was, where I came from, you know, whether I'm a Republican or a Democrat. There was a problem. You created a community. Everybody got together. And it's not only when we have a problem. We've got to create that community within our families, within our friends, within our schools, within our churches, within our temples. I, it really almost doesn't matter. When you're what? Yeah. When there's yes. a problem, it's easier to build a community. There is, it is. But when there's not that same thing with September 11th, how do you galvanize people around the same issue? Well, well it's you also ask them. when it's fun. I mean, look yeah. at Soul Cycle. Yeah. Right. Look at Well That's and Good. I mean, there are communities that are bound together by joy and what's fun. And I think you just have to have belief in whatever your cause, your purpose. Um, you have to believe and have the conviction to say, join me. Like, will you join me? And I think it's hard for a lot of people to ask. But if you don't believe in your ask, no one will join you. So I think it starts with you believing in whatever it is that you want to galvanize people around and then making the ask. And for the most part, people want to join. It, it's so true. When we did our very first Raise for the Cure in 1983, everyone said to me, "They will never. nobody will come. Nobody's going to come for breast cancer. You, you die from breast cancer. But we provided an experience, it was an experience of, you know, the pink, it was just my sister's favorite color, that's why we developed pink. And, uh, but we, it gave people a bonding experience. They got to work on something. People do love shared projects, particularly when they see them going somewhere, you know, when they feel they're meeting a need. And they do, you're right, they have fun, it's an experience, they want to come back, and, and you're right, Donna, one plus one plus one plus plus just adds up to a lot of people. But it's a conviction, the purpose, the goal, and all that. Who and doesn't love to get dressed? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Come on. <laughs> we all love to get dressed. We like to do the stores. We like to, oh, I got that. And particularly today with communication on, you know, the web. I mean, we're all communicating sort of about the same thing or not. You know, when you find your community, you find what your passion is, and that's how you find your community. What do you love? We're all sitting here in healthcare. We're a community. It got created. 
and we find just with by being community, here. our community. Yeah. This is just a community. By being here. It's brilliant. Just take it to the next step. We have time for one question here in the back. Thanks. So, ooh, that was loud. Um, Ms. Karen and Ms. Whelan, I completely appreciate your comment about this is not fast enough. I love your alluding to you have to produce a collection at this period of time, and this is the longest thing it's ever taken you to do. So as a physician, me and many of my friends struggle with the same thing. So in your lightning fast round going through, whoever wants to comment on this, what's the one thing you think we can do to speed this up? Collaborate. Communicate. <laughs> <laughs> I think act, and no matter how small, you know, I'll give you, a, in my no seconds left, I'll give you a perfect example. So my son is a very active kid, total spaz. If he doesn't work out before school, he can't concentrate all day long. The kid's seven years old, he's not reading, I'm on the road all the time, it's like becoming a major issue in my family. So you know what I did is I called his favorite PE teacher, and I said, I want to start a morning gym class for the boys, because they're all not doing well in school, and they're not able to focus. I'm going to throw some money in, my girlfriend's going to throw some money in, we got a line around a mission, we build a community, and now she just texted me on the train ride down here yesterday, and she said, I am so grateful you gave me this platform. We had 35 children in Morning Madness yesterday, and we're playing relay races for 30 minutes before school, and you know what, it was a small idea, I thought Lachlan and his buddy could go to the park with his PE teacher right before school, and now it's become a movement. And I really believe there is no act too small that each one of us can create in our lives that aligns with our own mission, having nothing to do professionally that can build community and have impact, and you just really never know what's gonna happen when you go after something with your heart. That's great. There's the soul cycle. There's the soul cycle. Here's to this entire I think you said panel. It. There's the soul cycle community, there's the yoga community, there's every part of those communities that want to get together to support one another, because no one person could do it. It is technically impossible. So this community, we all created a community. In some way, shape, or form, we're connected. So thank you so much thank to you. this amazing panel. Thank you. Thank you, thank you thank to everyone you. who has joined us. Um, and I hope that you guys will all connect when you leave and start your own morning madness, whatever that <laughs> might be. Have a great day. Thanks, guys. <laughs>